All right. Uh, good morning uh, to our members and viewers at home. Uh, good afternoon or uh, good evening, as the case may be, uh, to our uh, panelists who are joining us from around the Anglosphere. Uh, I'm Patrick Harris. I'm the chair of the ASB National Committee. Uh, I'm here with uh, Alexander Simon, who is one of our uh, summer fellows uh, from our uh, Chesterton Kuiper Fellowship Program. And uh, we have a real treat for you today, and uh, I'm going to allow uh, Alexander to uh, introduce our uh, guests. Uh, yeah, uh, first we have uh, William Clouston, the leader of the Social Democratic Party in the UK. Uh, William has served as the leader of the SDP since 2018. He originally joined the SDP in 1982 and campaigned in general elections, local elections, and by-elections throughout the 1980s. William presently serves on Corbridge Parish Council in Northumberland. Uh, we have Stephen Campbell, uh, has been, who has been the federal secretary of the Democratic Labor Party since 2015 and an executive member since 2008, following on from his parents and grandparents who have been involved with the DLP since the Australian Labor Party split of 1955. Steve is a qualified project manager and has been the campaign director for federal elections from 2010 to 2021. Uh, and then when finally, uh, last but not least, we have Ben Woodfin Woodfinden, uh, which is who is a, a doctoral candidate in political and constitutional theorist at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He's a contributor to the National Post and the Hub, and he publishes the Dominion Newsletter. All right. Uh, thanks, Alexander. Um, so we've invited our guests here today to talk about politics uh, beyond red and blue, um, as we said in our title of the panel, and uh, in other words, uh, outside the traditional or establishment political spectrum. And uh, what that spectrum looks like is a little bit different in uh, each of our respective countries. But I think that all of our guests will agree that there is something vital missing uh, that many ordinary voters are looking for uh, in Western democracies. And I think we share a number of key common understandings about what that is um, that I think we can broadly call a communitarian perspective. And uh, I'll start out by asking each of our guests a, a question individually to give their viewers a little bit more background knowledge, uh, um, as I expect uh, a lot of them will be new to the subject of uh, politics in uh, the UK, Australia, or Canada. Um, and after that, we'll try to open things up for a little bit broader discussion and back and forth. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll start with uh, Stephen Campbell, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, the history of the Democratic Labor Party and what it offers to Australian voters that's uh, distinctive in the political landscape there? Sure. Um, thanks again for having us on. Uh, the DLP, uh, Democratic Labor Party, has been around for quite a long time. The, uh, there was only originally one Labor Party in Australia, started in 1891 and uh, through till 1955, uh, when after a uh, an infiltration of the Communist Party into uh, trade unions and the uh, the Labor Party. Uh, here, there was a huge split. Um, the uh, Labor Party split into the Australian Labor Party and the Democratic Labor Party. Uh, it's basically been that way ever since. Now, the Democratic Labor Party, the Australian Labor Party, was probably kept out of power for any number of years, but we held the balance of power for about the next 25 years, 20 to 25 years. Uh, after that, we started at the about the start of the 80s when the supposed threat of communism that uh, was diminishing uh, or supposedly diminishing uh, a lot of people just went uh, turned away from our type of politics or our, our position and we started to diminish we hadn't oh, for quite a while we'd uh, we were just basically a party that went through the motions uh, about 15 years ago especially when the greens and i think we've all dealt with the greens in our uh, own area when the greens I came and started to um, take the fairly socialist ALP even further to the left, uh, especially in government, uh, when they were in government, uh, there was a bit of an outcry for, for people to do something. There were a number of conservative parties, but uh, no other Labor Party that was prepared to do anything against the ALP. So that was the start of the resurrection of the DLP. Uh, and from about, the, uh, from about 2005 onwards, the party has been growing had federal and state representatives uh and at, at the moment we, we're gaining quite a few members etc so yeah it's basically we have been an anti-communist party since we came into being in probably 1955. 
As for what we offer the, uh, the people in Australia, of course, it's uh, again, we have the same sort of thing, especially now where we have uh, where a lot of people are probably picking up on quite a few of our policies because, as some of you may already be aware, we're pretty well um, the scapegoat for anything that China wants to pick on. Um, uh, we tend to get the blame for everything, and so they throw problems at us, causes trade deal problems, etc. And uh, and certainly, we've the DLP has been no friend of, of the Chinese, and so the Australian uh, public have started to pick up on that. And so the anti anti communist, the left wing rhetoric that's been going through the media certainly has helped us because more and more people have become aware that you know, there's been a lot of apathy in Australian politics, and it's starting to die out. People are starting to become a bit more aware, and so we're getting a lot more support. Um, plus, most of the other minor conservative parties. Uh, have pretty well disappeared from the landscape in Australia. So it's left us in, in ethical situations. Um, it, we're about the only one that uh, upholds traditional family values, life issues, that sort of thing. Um, I guess I'll ask essentially the same question uh, to William. Um, what, what is the history of the, the Social Democratic Party? And I guess, what is your uh, elevator pitch, uh, as it were? Uh, thanks. Uh, well, the SDP was founded as an offshoot. We're an offshoot of the Labour Party historically. Um, the uh, party was established uh, 40 years ago, 1981, when four very prominent members of the Labour Party left. These were people that had been had all the key uh, cabinet positions and so on. Roy Jenkins, uh, David Owen, Shirley Williams and Bill Rogers. Uh, and it shook shook the left, and people say that it divided the left and allowed Thatcher in. Actually, there's not very much evidence for that for various reasons. But yeah, so we started then. Um, the idea was to break the mould of British politics, to change the voting system in particular, and to institute a new type of politics, I guess a, a red and blue type of politics, which is um, indicated in our colours. Uh, the 83 election, because of the voting system we we got uh, over a quarter of the vote but only 23 seats Labour Party got just over a percent higher than us and got 210 seats that's that's how bad it is really how difficult it is to get through um, we fought on with the Liberals in, in an alliance uh, in 87 didn't quite make the breakthrough then either although we got well over 20 percent of the vote and um, then there was a, a merger between the uh, Liberal Party uh, and the uh, SDP, but a lot of us didn't, uh, Social Democrats, and uh, were quite distinct from liberalism, and we uh, voted against that merger, and uh, the leader of the party at the time, uh, David Owen, uh, agreed with us, and, and so retained the independence of the SDP. Uh, we struggled on for another few years until he, he left in uh, 1990, and then the party was really not to the grassroots then, but as you know, political parties aren't prominent leaders there, uh, civic institutions, I guess, or civic associations, and uh, they are the members, and the members kept it going, and, and uh, all their membership fell from 80,000 at the peak to, to actually a few hundred at the bottom a few years ago. Uh, there was a resurgence um, a few years ago, which is partly, I mean, we can go into detail, but it's partly because there is no, no one representing this type of red and blue uh, blend of politics and British politics. All, all the major parties are liberal parties of various kinds. And, um, and you saw hints of this before our resurgence, actually, within the Tory party and the Labour Party. You may have heard of Philip Blonde's Red Tory project, excellent project, and um, Morris Glassman's Blue Labour project, again, an excellent project, and quite like us. And I think both Philip and, and Morris probably would regard us as, as their political kin. But we're trying to rebuild the party instead of trying to take over a party that really is not interested in your type of politics. We're trying to uh, rebuild the party from the grassroots and offer it directly to the public. Not so, not a pressure group inside a large party trying to build it again um, from the from from the grassroots up. And it's going pretty well. Membership's increasing into the uh, thousands, and we're contesting every uh, parliamentary by-election we can. We contested the London mayoral for the first time uh, in May, and uh, we got over I think 37,000 votes there which is a good start and I think over the over the month of May we got about 55,000 votes across the country in various elections in local government so on which is a lot for us at this stage of our development so yeah I mean we'll probably get into the detail of what we're offering 
is something different. It's a red and blue combination. And it probably, on the value divides, probably convenes about half the public. Thank you, William. So I'll ask a, uh, a slightly different question uh, to Ben, because he's not here as a representative of a political party per se, but as a observer uh, of the Canadian political scene uh, from the right. And uh, part of the reason we invited Ben is that we, we've had a number of uh, Canadian uh, friends and admirers of the Solidarity Party ask, uh, you know, oh, why isn't there some kind of political force like the ASP in, in Canada, even among minor parties? And, um, and with that in mind, um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about your own uh, political and intellectual background and about the the kind of outlook that you bring to the table um, and uh, how this fits into the political conversations uh, that are happening uh, in, in Canada right now, perhaps especially uh, among Canadian conservatives. Sure. Well, um, I think uh, Canada is no different, I think, to um, the United States and well, maybe not even to the United States, but certainly compared to um, other Anglo countries where uh, the kind of politics that uh, parties like uh, like you like you all represent um, uh, is that that market is certainly underserved in Canada. There's definitely um, you know everyone's seen these kind of these famous these quadrant kind of um, things in this top this you know, the, the top left quadrant. There's definitely a um, Canada's no different to um, to other countries. I don't think in that there is a kind of an underserved segment of the population that fits there. That is. Uh, is currently not represented by uh, by anyone. I think, um, if anything, there's a um, uh, Canadian politics is, uh, is, very, is very regional. So um, uh, that, that includes both the party systems. Um, so you have federal and provincial parties that uh, some of them have kind of formal links, but um, most of them do not. So conservative parties at the federal level, uh, conservative parties at the, pro the provincial level have no uh, no formal ties. Uh, one of the things that uh, that produces at the federal level is that you get this um, uh, a party that is very much kind of uh, trying to trying to juggle different uh, interests, different regional interests. Uh, but one of the kind of um, one of the unintended consequences of kind of the way it's evolved in the last uh, few decades here um, is just just like in uh, in other in other major countries, in other Anglo countries, uh, both all the major parties are uh, liberal parties. Uh, the Conservative Party is very much kind of a uh, Kind of a Western Canadian Liberal Party, um, so it's uh, kind of you know it's it's a Liberal Party that's also focused on things like uh, resource development, things like that. But um, uh, there's certainly not a kind of um, uh, some of the influences of American uh, uh, American politics kind of seep in uh, seep into into the Canadian system. So you still have um, you know foreign observers will think of the say the the the, the Republican Party, for example, in the U.S. as having you know these social conservative wings and uh, fiscal conservative wings. People still use that kind of language to talk about uh, the Conservative Party here, even though it's kind of a, uh, it doesn't really fit uh, in terms of how these, these things actually work. Uh, but one of the things it does is it really produces a, um, uh, like I say, a kind of an underserved segment. Um, the, the old, the kind of the history of, and this is kind of, this is a, I'll actually answer your question now. This is um, uh, my, my own kind of intellectual background is very much in, uh, the, the tradition here that gets called red Toryism um, and uh, Canadian red Toryism is kind of um, uh, it's very similar to the kind of uh, what was being proposed by uh, Philip Blond uh, when he when he wrote his book uh, a decade or so ago I think it was uh, but it has its own kind of uh, its own intellectual roots uh, and if, it's, and it is, if, if, if anything it's a kind of a homegrown uh, Canadian tradition the red uh, the, the um, red Tory today in Canadian politics is a kind of um, uh, the term is a kind of a pejorative, um, but it's used as a pejorative by kind of um, blue Tories uh, to attack uh, red Tories who are so-called kind of liberal light. Um, so uh, and now some kind of uh, liberal light conservatives basically will use that label to describe themselves, which of course is um, the actual red Tory tradition in Canada, which is um, kind of dormant, I would say right now, uh, but intellectually still alive. Is obviously not a kind of uh, the red doesn't come from kind of liberal red. It comes from a kind of socialist red. It's associated with people like uh, like George Grant, for example. Uh, and so the history of red Toryism in Canada is also kind of um, because it's kind of a homegrown tradition. Uh, it's very much a tradition of um, uh, our place in the world and specifically our relationship with America is kind of a central concern uh, to red Tories. Uh, and then uh, basically you get in the in the latter half of the 20th century you get kind of um, uh, the emergence of a kind of a new 
uh, the party eventually collapses, but the, the old uh, progressive conservative party uh, that, you know, 50 years prior would have been, say, uh, say would have been the party opposed to NAFTA, would have been the party opposed to kind of a, a free trade agreement with the United States. Uh, it flips. Uh, so in the 19, uh, 1980, uh, 88, I'm blanking on the exact year it was, I think 88 election, it's actually the liberals that are opposing uh, NAFTA and the, the Brian Wall and these conservatives that are in favor of it. Um, what that's, and so uh, what's happened there is that that red Tory tradition that was kind of associated with the old progressive conservative party, it was never dominant, it was never the sole tradition, uh, but that old tradition is certainly kind of uh, it's died out um, for the most part. It's, I would say it's still alive in um, sort of maritimes uh, in Eastern Canada. Um, but for the, for the most part, that tradition has kind of disappeared. It's been replaced by this kind of, um, this very, very kind of uh, liberal, liberal minded conservatism. Uh, and yet, it, what, what has happened here, I'll, I'll wrap up here, but it's kind of, uh, it leaves this, the same kind of underserved population that exists in other places, it exists in Canada too, but for kind of complicated regional, and uh, I think there's also kind of discursive reasons why it gets ignored. These people are basically, um, uh, basically kind of swept under the rug and ignored here. And that kind of leads perfectly into uh, our first discussion topic, which uh, I'll read here. It's generally acknowledged that there's a wide gap between the political classes of all our countries and the voting publics that they serve. For example, in the United States, the population tends to be further left on economic policies, such as uh, Medicare for all or other things based on opinion polling, and also often very uh, more, I'm sorry, tend to be more socially and culturally conservative or communitarian. Uh, the underrepresentation of the so-called upper left quadrant or the center upper left quadrant, as opposed to the neoliberal establishment, is something you see in many countries. Our question is, what is fueling this misalignment, either in general or in your own countries in particular? Do you want me to come in there? Yeah, any, anyone can just any, jump in. Anywhere, yeah, yeah. Right, so I, I think the I, I think there are lots of reasons for this, but the um, to some extent is... I try and summarize it by saying basically it's because our cultural elite um, and economic elite and uh, business elite are educated in the same way rather. And so you get people funneled through the education system, university system, coming out thinking largely the same things, which are basically liber liberal type of thinking. And, um, and they dominate the institutions. So they, you know, in this country, they dominate the BBC and in business, they dominate business. And, and obviously the academy is, 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 has very little viewpoint diversity, and they feed into politics. So basically every single political party uh, is, is supplied effectively by graduates having the same basic outlook. Now, the fact that it doesn't align perfectly with the, uh, you know, the, the range of views in the country is not surprising, because what you've got is, is basically an, an elite outlook. Um, and, uh, and, and Brexit actually was a very, very good illustration of this, where <clears throat> the uh, during the 2016 referendum, we we were the, one of the well, it was only us and the Communist Party basically on the on the left who argued for Brexit, but all the mainstream parties argued argued for staying in the EU. All of them. I mean, the Tories did, the Labour Party, the Lib Dems, massively enthusiastic. In fact, of the eight represented par parties in Parliament in Westminster, only one had an official policy of leaving the EU, and that was the DUP, which is quite a small. Um, uh, quite odd party actually in, 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 in Northern Ireland. But anyway, uh, but you know, they none of these parties represented what turned out actually to be the mainstream view. So I think to some extent the problem is simply a sort of supply side problem in that people coming into the, um, uh, the these various cultural elites uh, and business elites um, are funneled through a system which, which um, encourages them to rather to think in the same way. And you only have to speak to you know, people with cultural conservative attitudes in the academy, uh, any country, I mean, I've got a friend in Canada, <laughs> had a terrible time. I mean, it's, you know, who's a, 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 a professor there and, they, you know, he's having to go through various panels to check his opinions and so on. It's the same here. So the, that's, the, that's one of the basic reasons is um, that there is just a, a misalignment between how people think, uh, how the educated, university educated think and how the rest of us think. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the cure for it if you're interested in solutions, is to is to get a, a change to the electoral system, which allows parties to get rep representation quickly, who represent the views of the hinterland. Simple as that. Look, I'd probably uh, greatly agree with William on that. Uh, it, with 
the same sort of things affected us here. Uh, I speak from a Labor Party side of uh, uh, point of view in Australia. We've got uh, from a party that was basically, well, I think it was once referred to as the cream of the working class is now the dregs of the middle class. Um, we've, uh, we've got a situation where I can't think of more than a handful of people who are in our parliament, federal parliament, um, that are not the typical university educated brainwashed um uh yes you know yes man who walks into a political party and does whatever he's told the party machine rules uh it wasn't that long ago that you had people who were prepared to, to take a stand cross the floor uh, stand out for their constituents now i'm not kidding when i say i, I it's hard for me to remember the last time somebody in our federal parliament crossed the floor and voted with the other side um so it's but you might as well send one person in here carrying a wad of proxies uh so what uh, what has happened lately though that uh, uh is probably slightly encouraging considering our conservative wing our liberal and national parties referred to as the coalition here uh have definitely taken a leftward bent um we've got a movement within the alp something that the dlp has fought for for many years to try and support them uh, move in the alp to actually bring it back towards the right. Um, we've got the left wing of the ALP has got some very tenacious workers, but they've elected uh, the man who's the leader of the uh, of the ALP, so the leader of the opposition in Australia, Anthony Albanese. He's one of those, everybody likes him, but you know, I mean, he just doesn't sort of, he doesn't come across in the media. He's very much like, like a Jeremy Cor uh, Corbyn. He's very much to the left, well to the left, but he hasn't got Corbyn's um, uh, capabilities when it comes to speaking to the public. So the, he's brought the left down considerably and the right wing of the ALP is pushing its way back. And one of the reasons also is because there's been a, a backlash. We've we've had any number of people leaving the coalition parties who joined us now as members, uh, simply because they've abandoned. They say the Liberal Party and the National Party have abandoned their principles, ethical principles. Uh, you've you've got the same sort of things happening in your countries, but uh, the um, without getting into into the topic broadly, just to sort of say uh, the trans transgenderism uh, aspect. Uh, the dysphoria stuff that's been it's been pushed. Uh, we have some very hard left state governments, and our education and health and things like that are controlled by the state governments. And uh, we have kindergarten children who are basically being having this as, as forced indoctrination on them, uh, and that's caused an enormous backlight, a backlash from what was previously an apathetic public uh, who were fed up to the back teeth with um, with politics. And happy to just get on with their lives have now realized that by doing that uh, they've allowed both sides of politics to just come in and try to usurp their role as, as parents to uh, dominate their family life to indoctrinate their kids and take their country in the direction that they never wanted it to be um, so where so the dlp gets a lot more support now a right wing of the alp is gaining uh, some support the coalition has just as we're basically telling them they've got to wake up to themselves. I had a conversation recently with somebody who is from a major lobby group in, a, in Australia who is looking, who would normally be there backing to the hilt with money, with press, with media, a lot backing the coalition who is now working to actually get the coalition out in a certain election. Then the state election will be coming up fairly soon simply because they figure unless they're taught a lesson and less people actually realize that there's going to be a backlash against them it's it's just going to get worse um so yeah i, I would say that uh, william's right certainly there, there is just a single-mindedness about people who come out of our educational institutions and that single mind is not very um politically savvy uh and for those uh, for those who are probably um and small parties such as ours we're representing those people, not just the DLP, but others in, in Australia are representing what would refer to as the grassroots, those people who are down, uh, who have absolutely feel that they have been abandoned by any major political party. Um, and while we don't get much support this way, even the green supporters in this country have started looking for other parties because they are pretty well fed up with the greens as well. 
Yeah, I'll um, I'll just uh, I'll try and I'll, this might be a slightly different answer to the question. Um, so uh, Canada, Canada is the same in that um, uh, we have a kind of a, a homog homogeneity kind of the professional classes that uh, dominate basically every uh, professional and elite institution. So every uh, as we we're saying academic, uh, media, uh, political institutions. Um, but I think one of the kind of um, uh, one of the one of the uh, one, one, something that kind of helps to kind of uh, distort this even more. Uh, is that in the, the Canada's kind of questions in Canada? I don't think there are many countries in the world that obsess about their, who, what it means to be um, Canadian as much as Canadians do. Um, and uh, kind of the way this plays out, uh, in, at least has played out in the last kind of 40 years or so, uh, is that uh, Canadians are so much of these, these kind of these soul searching questions about uh, what it means to be Canadian are very much kind of in contrast with. Um, uh, with America uh, and Canadians trying to figure out what makes them not of why are they why are we not why are Canadians not just Americans? Um, well, I would I, I would suggest that um, uh, something that's happened in the last kind of four decades or so, three or four decades, uh, is that kind of the there was a kind of um, a post war order that was a kind of a reimagining of Canadian identity uh, associated with someone like Pierre Trudeau, uh, especially. Um, and uh, so it involved things like, you know, changing the flag, uh, new flag, uh, repatriating the constitution, bringing in a charter uh, of charter rights and freedoms. Uh, and uh, basically what happens is that Canadian identity now, at least kind of as elites want to, um, although this is changing very rapidly as we speak, but um, Canadian elites kind of want to imagine that being Canadian is a kind of, um, and, and more importantly, not being American uh, is very much to do with, um, uh, kind of progressive liberal values. Um, so the kind of national identity has been kind of reoriented around kind of uh, not being American means being more liberal, more progressive than, uh, than Americans. Uh, so again, that has very distorting effects on uh, on our politics. Uh, the Liberal Party, the, the kind of, still the kind of natural governing party here are kind of uh, paradoxically, they're hyper-liberal, but they're also kind of paradoxically hyper, hyper-nationalistic. Uh, but they're very good at kind of, um, Kind of, uh, I'll, I'll give you a recent example. So um, there's been debates in Canada over uh, legislation that kind of is going to basically bring kind of um, the digital digital media, whatever you want to call it, into under the umbrella of what's uh, kind of Canadian content regulation. Uh, and uh, Canada, because it wants to, because it's had this kind of this, this desire to protect its uh, its, its cultural identity, uh, has had uh, in kind of TV, music, uh, radio, all sorts of things, has had what uh, what we call here CanCon rules. Canadian content rules, and some of the rules are kind of um, uh, quite uh, quite quite absurd uh, in terms of kind of how they get applied. Uh, but the broad broad point of them is to basically protect, make sure that you know Canadian Canadian media is not just swamped by American uh, American saturated American media. Um, so there was a, an attempt. Is Bill Bill, Bill C ten was the uh, the tech name for it. Uh, there was an attempt recently to kind of um, by the Heritage Minister here to kind of update update this regime to include. Uh, digital di digital platforms and stuff, and the the the, the liberals were the ones that championed this, uh, and so they they champion it and they've snuck in all sorts of kind of you know Canadian content now includes you know diversity inclusion kind of stuff, and that's kind of the true essence of Canadian Canadian identity. Uh, but interestingly, the um, you would think in a if you maybe if you were, if you if you take a more abstract approach, you think maybe the conservatives would kind of uh, be interested in kind of you know protecting Canadian content or Canadian culture. Um, but the, the the conservatives have kind of led the charge against uh, against this legislation. It's all been about kind of free speech, free choice, uh, uh, kind of you know open internet kind of stuff. Um, and so so the kind of uh, you have a kind of a paradoxically a kind of a liberal uh, liberal national party that kind of uploads liberalism into its nationalism, and it's quite popular as a result. And then a kind of uh, a conservative party that uh, kind of uh, doesn't do much conserving. Uh, precisely because it ends up kind of uh, adopting the kind of the opposite of that view, but then ends up adopting these kind of um, just a kind of an, a, a different kind of right liberal, uh, right liberal version of this. Um, so has so has very little to say about kind of you know uh, something like that, like distinctive Canadian culture or Canadian content. Uh, but the kind of the, the the way that all this plays out really does create this kind of this, this kind of this illusion of kind of the spectrum, the kind of national spectrum available to people, just being a kind of this kind of progressive liberal nationalism um, versus this kind of um, kind of anti-national classical liberal almost uh, approach. And these are the kind of sort of um, 
and it kind of creates this, this kind of, I would say, this kind of false hegemony of liberalism in this country. It really doesn't reflect kind of realities on the ground, and especially also in all sorts of parts of the country. Um, but this kind of, this, this way this dynamic plays out really does kind of lend credence to it, kind of, uh, it makes it seem like uh, the, only, the only answers on the table are, are liberal answers when um, it's these kind of these weird dynamics that kind of play with it, uh, feed each other that really produce these uh, this kind of, uh, it's very kind of stilted uh, political environment. So uh, Ben's response touches on a question that uh, we already wanted to ask, uh, which is about the uh, the influence of the United States uh, and, and American politics uh, on your own country's politics in the last decade. Um, I think uh, this, to some extent, this um, happens all over the world. Is um, just as the world has gotten smaller, there's more attention to what previously would have been thought of as domestic politics of, of other countries, but perhaps it's especially true in the Anglosphere, uh, particularly because of the influence of uh, the, the, the online discourse. And um, so I wanted to ask uh, each of you, and more generally, how, how you think American politics have uh, played a role and, um, and how do you feel about that influence or the, you know, the political language or the, you know, style of politics that sometimes gets imported as a result of that? Um, I, it's, I, I think we're, I think to be, I mean, only have to see last, last summer's cultural moment um, and witness it to see that any, any country in the ang Anglosphere particularly, to be, at, to be in the Anglosphere is to be potentially vulnerable to uh, the importation of U.S. Uh, political pathologies that aren't always, I, uh, first, aren't always entirely applicable, really, but get adopted nevertheless. And and I, in relation to the BLM um, uh, event last last summer, really, the speed, I mean, it may have been related to the pandemic to some extent, but the speed at which it washed over <clears throat> um, various societies, and ours in Britain included, uh, was, was really something to behold. Um, uh, and uh, what it involved really was importing, you know, types of hyper-racial politics to to countries where they they don't entirely apply. Uh, I think we were doing rather well actually before before that happened, and I think in in a sense you were doing rather well before it happened. But it was a I think it was also a poor reflection on our own political culture uh, to be so vulnerable to that so quickly. I mean, to have there were some quite interesting examples of where. You know, uh, BLM supporters in in the in, in London were sort of holding their hands up to bemused British policemen who are unarmed and saying, "Don't shoot." I mean, they literally were 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 in another place, really. Um, so, and I suppose people people moan about. I mean, I think the reality a lot of this is, comes from the academy, and the academy are just sheer numbers and thought, and in, in the English speaking world is dominated by the United States. So you're going to get it to some extent but as i say i think it's a poor reflection on our own uh lack of resistance to it um and it, there's there's you could have a very detailed debate about its origins or how far back it goes or the reasons for it i thought aris rusinos who's a writer uh, for unheard in this country uh commented that it was um it was a sort of species of North Sea Protestantism, and you could trace these things back to the Reformation and purity and all that. And I think certainly some of the performative stuff that went on last summer in the States and continues to go on, uh, I suppose religious fundamentalists in the Reformation uh, would, would understand it, or any revolutionary would understand it. Um, it certainly resembles that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, what's been frustrating is that the narratives get adopted, get imported, and then are applied whether they're, apl whether they're applicable or not. Yeah, I think it was a similar situation in Australia to an extent, not uh, quite as much, and I can only go by the media that I picked up from uh, the US and, and the UK, but uh, a number of it was short-lived. We had the Black Lives Matter um, rallies in Australia, the, the marches through the streets. Um, we've had the counterculture stuff that was going on. A lot of it's died very quickly. Um, uh, first of all, there was just certainly Australia had, had, does not have slavery, hasn't had slavery. Uh, we've had a different um, situation where we have a, an indigenous population that lived here for thousands upon year, uh, thousands of years prior to whites arriving, and have uh, had a pretty bad go of it ever since whites arrived. 
Um, and there's been a bit of a backlash uh, towards government attitudes to the Indigenous uh, over a, a fair while. So that's where the Black Lives Matter thing, the, the, the attitude towards police, uh, et cetera, that came out of the United States, didn't actually come across exactly the same way in, the, in Australia. It was basically translated into a, a more action needed for the Indigenous community. And it's, it's provoked quite a bit of outcry, but it was already part of the political agenda uh, it was growing so this just added fuel to it and probably moved it three or four years ahead in a, in a matter of months so it's actually not a bad thing in some ways uh as i said the counterculture sort of thing it didn't go it, it, that hasn't really been a problem we haven't had the desecration of statues and people pulling things down all over the place there's been a little bit of that but that's the copycat uh, attitude uh but uh, look, generally, uh, Australian, Australians actually like Americans uh, as a rule. Um, probably, well, since the Second World War, we've been very close, of course. The, the major criticism here that occurs, and that comes from the left media, uh, and, and does find uh, uh, some support in the general population, is that Australia has a tendency to uh, jump into um, a fight if the, if the Americans say, you know, would you like to come in and help? Yep, we'll come in and help. So instead of, you know, thinking about it, taking your time, making a decision, it doesn't always happen, but uh, um, Middle East, for instance, we've, you know, we've been there again and again. Uh, and I think some aspects of the left wing of, of Australian politics use that to, uh, and escalate it and exaggerate it to um, gain ground in their anti-American polemic. But uh, quite frankly, I would dare say that you'll find that Eight out of ten Australians think Americans are, are fine. I think our relationship's good, and quite frankly, uh, however it's been over the last ten years, the last twelve months, twelve to fourteen months, has been yeah, very interesting in the change uh, in attitudes. Because uh, under under Obama, I think a lot of Australians felt whichever side you were of politics you came from felt like Australia was pretty well forgotten. A lot of other things were coming up and Australia wasn't really taking that all that seriously. Uh, Trump came along and because Trump decided to get a little bit more involved on the China issue, the Pacific became more interesting and then Australia was targeted by the Chinese. And so we obviously were getting a, a, a fair degree of support from uh, from the United States in, in our stance. Uh, I think it was our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who was the first one to call for an investigation into the COVID virus and that you can imagine that they went down with China. So um, we've sort of been copying it ever since, just in the last week, more threats from China, uh, the launching of missiles and all that sort of rubbish. But uh, the Americans have always been uh, seen as a great ally of ours. And now with all of this uh, fairly aggressive talk going on, uh, we found that over the last few years and especially the last 18 months, the relationship's gotten a lot closer and we feel like we're actually being taken seriously to the point and, and the Australian public are quite uh, happy with all of this to the point where they're actually looking at uh, increasing military participation within Australia, United States forces, etc., on our shores. And most people have no problem with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, um, yeah, this is, this is a topic of, as I, as I mean, kind of building on it before, uh, so I'll kind of carry on where I left off, but, um, this is a kind of, um, it's a Canadian obsession almost to kind of, uh, to kind of think about ourselves in relation to America. The, the, uh, Pietro Do, uh, likened, likened Canada's position in the world to, uh, to being in the bed, in a bed with an elephant, uh, and just in terms of, you never know when they're going to roll over, um, and so, so, so Canada's, so Canada's always had that, Canada's very existence in some ways kind of, at least as we've kind of, some, some have liked to kind of imagine is kind of a, uh, in, in contrast with uh, uh, kind of, um, with America. Um, but then uh, what that, the, the, the way that kind of modern media developed, especially is that um, uh, as much as we have these kind of, I was talking about these kind of CanCon rules, uh, Canadians are still uh, saturated in American news. and. Um, uh, Canadians will consistently kind of know more about what's going on in America than they do uh, in Canada, and in some sense, that's not it, that's not all. It's not a kind of a universal bad thing. I think a lot of the time it's because uh, Canadian politics is quite boring, uh, which um, uh, that might again that might not necessarily be a bad thing. It might mean that some places are fairly well governed, um, but I think a lot of the time is that Canadians um, 
they have, as I, I was saying earlier, that we have this kind of modern now anti-Americanism that's about kind of being more liberal, more progressive than Americans. Um, but uh, Canadian politics, really, the American politics warps Canadian politics in some some kind of strange ways. So, um, kind of you might call, you might can almost call it kind of blue state nationalism, where to be Canadian is to be a kind of a is to be a kind of progressive Democrat in some ways. Um, I mean, the, the, uh, t t so so during uh, during Republican administrations, you consistently get kind of um, you know whenever for some reason pollsters will ask Canadians, you know, who would you vote for if you were voting for. Trump or Clinton, Trump or Biden, Bush or Kerry kind of thing. And the numbers are consistently, you know, like high 80s would vote for the Democrats and like like barely barely double digits would vote for the Republican. Uh, but the kind of distorting impact that has is it really does, um, it really does turn um, Can Canadian, so much, uh, Canadian, any, any Canadian politician, any conservative Canadian politician here doesn't want to get labeled as, uh, you know, Canadian Trump or Canadian Bush or whatever. Um, and so, um, uh, for example, the, the last Conservative Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, was um, uh, because he supported he was uh, he supported the Iraq War. Uh, the Liberals actually were the ones that decided not to uh, not to go into Iraq with uh, uh, this is under Prime Minister Gretchen. Um, uh, Harper was dogged by that um, consistently the last five years. Any any Conservative politician has been compared to Trump if they can. I mean, someone like. Um, Take uh, the, uh, the premier Doug Ford, uh, Ontario's premier Doug Ford. Uh, the man has a kind of um, uh, a maybe you want to call it like a populist streak, and uh, you know he kind of you know big big blonde gentleman, shall we say? Um, so uh, there's kind of some superficial similarities there. Um, but again, the comparison really doesn't work when you look at kind of you know things Ford has consistently done and said, uh, and kind of how Canadian populism in that sense manifests. Uh, but because we have this kind of this. this Simulacrum, if I could use that word, uh, where we impose kind of American uh, American politics onto Canadian politics. Everything gets evaluated by these standards. Um, and um, I mean, so for example, we had um, uh, we we had our own kind of our, we're having our, we're having our new current version of a kind of a racial reckoning right now when it comes to uh, Indigenous stuff. Some uh, some awful kind of tragic stuff that's really um, kind of coming to the forefront with uh, residential schools in Canada. Um, and so we've had kind of um, statue tearing down. Uh, we've had kind of uh, the John A. Macdonald, who was the first, uh, the first kind of post-Confederation Canadian prime ministers. I think he's got, I think he had something like, there was 18 or something different statues of him across the country. And one by one, they're, uh, they're coming down with um, uh, very little resistance, interestingly. If you look at the polling consistently, the um, vast majority of Canadians think these statues should probably stay up, or at the very least, they shouldn't be kind of torn down by uh, protesters, but then uh, when you listen to kind of media coverage of it, you wouldn't know that um, you would assume that everyone wants these statues to come down. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't know that there's kind of a, a real distorting effect there. And some of this stuff, so especially last summer, some of this was definitely a kind of um, an importation of um, of kind of American Americanized uh, identity stuff into into Canada. Canada has kind of had its own kind of experience with kind of. Uh, its own kind of history that uh, it, needs to, it needs to reckon with on its own terms, but this Americanizing of it is often quite uh, quite unhelpful. Um, uh, there was there was an incident last summer, for example, where a, uh, a sad, a very tragic incident where a woman, uh, a black woman in Toronto, basically um, there'd been some sort of domestic disturbance at her apartment, and um, she 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 I, I, I'm forgetting I'm blanking all the details, but she basically the police arrived. She ended up kind of trying to sneak out the balcony and she fell off the balcony and she died. Um, so very, very sad. Uh, but you had the uh, the NDP leader, uh, the New Democrats, kind of the kind of socialist, left, the left wing party here, uh, basically trying to compare this to kind of a, you know, like a police brutality um, kind of kind of experience. And uh, there was a police investigation. It was uh, it was a kind of a, just a tragic accident. It was uh, the police had no kind of involvement in her death itself. Uh, but there was a real kind of um, distorting effect there where uh, imposing kind of Americanized, American standards here uh, really did lead to some kind of very nasty and very, uh, very uh, unpleasant um, uh, discussion about this kind of thing. Um, so this is, this, is, um, this is how these kind of these, these, uh, these dynamics play out here. Uh, it's very hard, it is very hard to resist. There are people like me that kind of try and consistently kind of urge Canadians to think about politics in their own terms and not just kind of uh, impose American standards on it, but the kind of the saturation that we still have uh, in American media and stuff, and just kind of the general kind of level of apathy and knowledge about Canadian politics versus American politics means you do get these kind of very distorting 
uh, strange effects sometimes where you have this kind of this implicit uh, blue state nationalism, I think you could probably call it, that kind of dominates kind of expectations around politics in Canada. There's a... Can I just add one point on there? Uh, sorry, I won't, be, no, won't take long. One thing I didn't mention, uh, which the others uh, have, of course, the situation with the police. Of course, Black Lives Matter was not just really for uh, for that. You had your uh, defund police in the United States and you've had, uh, well, similar calls, I think, in other countries. Uh, we, we actually didn't get that. There's a fair degree of respect for the police in, in Australia, not everywhere, but uh, for, uh, for the police. And the only thing at that point we had because of the COVID situation, we'd had lockdowns, certainly not to the extent that um, your countries have had, but uh, the police were involved in that. And they were seen almost in the same light as uh, the health professionals uh, doing a job that needs to be done to keep people safe, et cetera. So at the time that the Black Lives Matter rallies were going on, they weren't particularly targeted. So at, on that side of things, the police haven't come off badly in, in Australia. I, uh, I was just going to quickly touch on, there's a common thread here, which is uh, sort of institutional decay or like the production of elites who believe in a certain type of agenda, typically through the university system. And it, it was in the news recently, there was a North Korean defector who attended an American university that said that uh, wokeism, you know, is comparable to communist propaganda. And she, you know, said some other things like the West is doomed. So my question to you is, how do you go about solving it from a communitarian perspective, the problem of the institution producing people who just fundamentally uh, are, are kind of brainwashed into this ideology? I think, I think it's extremely difficult to, um, for politicians to, to, to uh, react to it, actually, partly because, uh, and it's a sort of tired old phrase, but so much of this is downstream of culture. What, what happens is it, the cultural turn happens first uh, and uh, po possibly through the academy and then cultural leaders. And then um, by the time it hits politics, um, it can be too late almost. I mean, in the UK, we've had a nominally conservative government for, you know, into its 12th year. But the rollover of the institutions to a terrible word, but woke or progressive modernism uh, is pretty much complete. I mean, you know, they, they, the, the Tories haven't, haven't done anything about it, haven't been able to resist it. Uh, and it's only re recently, actually, partly because of electoral dynamics that they've, they've sort of cottoned onto it and, and started to realise the public are a little bit upset about their, um, their traditions and their nation being constantly derided uh, by uh, rather privileged people uh, running institutions which ought to be there to partly protect um, some of our cultural inheritance. So by the time it happens, that often the often the politicians are sort of reacting to it rather than rather than changing it. It's it's a, it's a very very difficult. You've got to fight it, but they by the time um, it, it occurs, a lot of the march through these institutions has, has, has largely occurred and uh the the the, the politics is slightly behind the the game uh, can i just before we go on i, I just wanted to uh, respond to some of the things that benjamin said earlier i think this this importation of um a, a sort of i would describe it as an american sort of political lens or cultural lens onto things it's very very superficial as you say um <clears throat> you when when you start importing the terms the sort of easy terms white privilege um, white supremacy, cultural appropriation, all this ID politics stuff. Um, they're very easy terms, but once you start thinking about things in ID terms and you apply that lens to everything, you'll see it everywhere. Literally, you see, see it everywhere, even where it doesn't exist. And, and once you're at that stage, it is very, very difficult to, to combat. And, and, and also the comparisons, as you say, I mean, Boris Johnson was, was seen as the, uh, as the American Trump and actually, Whopper in the New York Times actually referred to. I mean, that's a supremely ignorant uh, position to have. I mean, he's he's he he's a liberal absolutely through and through a Whig, you know. And he's not. I mean, I suppose he says populist things, but um, uh, it's it's like the 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 comparing Brexit itself to to um, you know Trump's election win in 2016. Uh, it's very lazy to to uh, associate them so closely i mean you, you know um but it does happen i mean and once it happens it, it's it's difficult to 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 combat so we uh we've got to wrap things up fairly soon because we've got another event coming in behind us um but uh, I, I would be remiss uh, if, if i didn't ask uh, 
just to shift gears a bit, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask a kind of nerdy question, uh, which is um, about the uh, the economic platforms uh, and specifically about distributism, which has been a uh, important uh, influence on the uh, on the ASP's economic platform. I know it has been uh, for for the DLP in Australia as well, and, and I believe. Uh, William told me in a previous conversation that uh, he always tries to work a Chesterton quote into his uh, speeches. And um, I, I know in, in I, I know less well uh, how influential those ideas have been in Canada, although I know that um, other third way movements like social credit have, uh, have had an important role in Canadian political history. And, and with all that in mind, um, and, and trying to keep our answers a little bit brief, um, do you see an agenda focused on uh, broadening ownership uh, as something uh, that your countries need, and and what are the obstacles to that kind of uh, wider distribution of economic power and security? Well, if I might take the uh, first lead on this one, uh, yeah, in Australia, there's a little bit of a movement that there was traditionally not a great movement in cooperatives or anything along those lines, but certainly the cooperative movement is growing. Uh, distributive principles, well, we've been getting them out there for a while, but it is a bit hard to get them through uh, a media that just doesn't want to understand. So we're actually in the process of creating our own media outlet to do it ourselves. Um, now, uh, most of the situation here is uh, people are in a position where they want to have more say, they want to have more influence over their own lives, um, over their own uh, publicly owned institutions, etc. but they don't know how it can occur. Uh, distributism gives them a very good answer for that sort of thing at the moment where uh, a few years ago, uh, Senator Madigan, uh, DLP senator in uh, 2013, I think I it was, was pushing the, uh, the fact that um, states, the states in Australia were in control of the rules and laws on, on um, cooperatives, and it needs to have a bit more of a, um, uh, a bit more of a, an involvement at the local level rather than just at the state government level, um, and uh, strangely, in so doing, organised for a um, a bit more of dialogue that led to a Senate inquiry into um, the, the entire cooperative movement throughout Australia. 2016, that occurred, and a lot of good things have come out of it. Not many have been implemented yet, but they are on the way. And we found a number of groups that are quite keen on developing that. Uh, but the other thing is, like everything else, everything we've talked about, even the other topics we'd love to talk about, media in our country is very difficult to get anything through. If they don't, if they don't understand it, they don't talk about it. They won't go on about it. Um, one of the things we put forward a proposal. I've spoken to a number of people at the moment. We'll probably push it up. We'll have a general election in a few months, uh, and we'll be putting that forward as well. We have the public uh, broadcast of the ABC, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, that we're basically trying to change because both sides of politics don't want it. Uh, they're very hard left wing in their in their attitude, but even the conservative government can't stop that. We're trying to get it converted into a co cooperative uh, with broad public ownership of the uh, of the station. Um, it's gained a, a lot of, every, every person I've spoken to have just sort of stopped and double blinked because they hadn't thought of that. And it, it's something that's seen as a possible answer to the media problem. Um, from the left wing in Australia, at least at that level. So these are the sort of things that we're hoping will actually occur and might make some major changes over the next four to five years. Yeah, um, we're, we're, we're strong advocates of what we call the social market, uh, you know, have been for 30 years. And I think the simplest way to understand that is the summary that the state and the uh, market aren't opponents, uh, they're part of the you know, complementary parts of the same society. So this, this, the quickest route actually um, to have a fairer distribution of assets generally is to for the state to reclaim some of the of what's been taken from it in the neoliberal turn, the new right turn uh, over the last 30, 40 years. And, and, and that involves you know, proper um, nationalization of the railways and the utilities and for the state to get back in the business of uh, large scale uh, council house building, which, which we advocate. Um, I think on a on a broader uh, look at it, you've got to you've got to accept that there's been a a, a general tendency for fewer but larger players uh, in the market. Uh, you know, you might call it this sort of Amazon effect. We might call it the Tesco effect in the UK. And I think what what uh, regulators and public policy has to be very careful of here is to allow uh, smaller participants to. Uh, 
to get into the market and, and play a play a, um, a, a role. I think I think regulation uh, often in I mean you only have to look at small political parties, for instance. Regulation is so complex and suits larger players to such an extent that you know there will come a time where where smaller entities, family businesses, and other things just find it very very difficult to actually trade. So they have to look at that. And the final final thing I'd say is that we we must look at debt. Because again, the uh, I think the um, neoliberal economic record is utterly atrocious. On the published data in the UK, the ONS produces actually the Keynesian model, the Butzkerite model, post-war had higher investment, higher employment rates, higher growth, better record on trade deficits, and so on than the post-Thatcherite uh, era. And now, how they've got away with claiming that the neoliberal turn has been effective or uh, in these terms, I, I don't know. I mean, it's been utterly abysmal. And what it's done is created, has, has, has just given debt everywhere. It's produced debt in uh, the corporate sector. It's produced record debt in the household and uh, individual sector and m massive um, government debt. So what we've got with neoliberal economics is a lot of people getting very, very rich at the top, assets being hoarded, uh, land and other assets being hoarded at the top, and um, the rest of the public be, being laden with debt. So I think we need to look at that and we would go, we're gonna issue a green paper quite soon uh, and it's gonna be quite radical. I think you need to look at uh, credit, uh, you know, capping of credit in certain areas and, 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 and stop this process because unless you do, you have an entire society that is in a hock to, um, to, to the banks and has no chance of, 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 of keeping what it has. So I think we need to look at debt. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll shift to something else that I think is a kind of um, a specific, but uh, in Canada, I think in the Anglosphere in general, um, if we're talking about widespread ownership, something that's going to be a kind of an issue at the fore is going to be real estate. Um, in Canada, this is an issue. I know in uh, Britain, it's an issue too. I believe I basically, and I know in America, it's kind of a, it's a rising issue. But I think if there's one kind of, um, uh, if, there's, if there's one kind of thing right now where kind of widespread ownership of of assets and resources is going to be kind of increasingly come to the fore. It's going to be in terms of real estate. Uh, I know it looks different in every single country, but Canada is increasingly becoming a kind of uh, have and have not country when it comes to housing. And, um, and related to William's point, people are taking on uh, you know enormous boatloads of debt to just kind of get into the get into this ladder, and um, so you know, you know taking on these ginormous mortgages. Um, so in terms of um, uh, yeah, I know we're running out of time, so I'll just wrap, I'll wrap up quickly here. But um, yeah, if there's one kind of a widespread ownership issue that I suspect in the next decade is really going to be a uh, come to the fore, it's going to be around housing uh, and kind of how how we live in, how we approach housing, how whether whether we want a society or need a society where everyone owns their house, and whether whether you can have this kind of zero sum situation where there's this kind of endless expectation of house price increases in order to kind of fund retirement and push kind of push other kind of problems down the road. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there, but yeah. Um, I guess we'll just end it off with this. I know this is a horrible question to ask you to only do 30 seconds on, but I'm gonna ask you to try to do your best. Um, uh, we'll end it with what kind of strategies do you think will be effective for community minded folks moving into the future? And what do you think the prospects are for the revival of this sensibility in your nation's politics? 30 seconds. <laughs> Um, I, 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 you've got to build it up from the grassroots. Um, don't spend too much time on social media, all that is, that, that is important. Uh, and from an optimistic point of view, remember that what many of us are promoting is already aligned with people's views. Okay, so you've got a big uh, head start there. Yeah, people know what they want. Uh, they just need somebody to come out and actually show a little bit of guidance. Uh, and to be totally honest, the major parties are being <laughs> one of our greatest assets here by uh, pretty well turning people off because they're not providing anything they really want. So stick to your guns, stick to your principles, explain things very clearly and concisely, and you'll actually get success. It's working well. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, all good answers. I, I've just finished by saying, I think post COVID, I think the last year people being kind of locked, well, depending on where you are, being locked in their houses, a lot of people by themselves. Um, I think really has forced some people to think more, more about kind of things they weren't previously thinking about when it comes to kind of uh, atomization, kind of family, friendship, things like that. Um, so I think there's actually a real opportunity post-COVID to kind of really get people to think about these kind of the kind of yeah. communitarian bonds that they crave uh, without necessarily realizing kind of the thing that they were missing. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you to all of our uh, panelists, uh, William Clouston, uh, Stephen Campbell, uh, Ben Woodfinden. We
we uh, have really appreciated the conversation that we've had this morning. Um, and uh, we'll hope that we'll all uh, I'll stay in touch and we wish you all the best of luck. Um, we are going to go ahead and move into our uh, next event.